Soldier Field. Um, tonight we're going to be having Carrie Nakagawa. Uh, Carrie is an author of Through the Diamond, 100 Years of Japanese American Baseball, and A History of Japanese American Baseball in California. He is the project director of the nonprofit Nisei Baseball Research Project, curator of the Diamonds in the Rough exhibit, produced curriculums with the student projects for intellectual community enhancement at Stanford University. He's also produced multiple documentaries and the dramatic narrative award-winning film, American Pastime. Kari Nakagawa, author, filmmaker, historian. Joining him today is King 5 News' Tony Black, who will be our moderator. Sweet. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it very much. Kerry, thanks for taking the time to have a conversation with us tonight. Before we get going into the meat of what we're talking about, I wanted to see if you would share the story that we were talking about before everyone arrived here about your local connection here, particularly in Auburn. Well, for me, it's uh, thank you, Tony. And um, it's just always precious and priceless for me to come back to Seattle because my mom was uh, born a little shameless plug. There's a small uh, home, historical home called the Neely Mansion in Auburn, Washington, uh, about 20 minutes from here. And uh, my mom was uh, one of 11 brothers and sisters. My grandfather had a dairy farm. So the Neelys uh, had the uh, dairy farm in the late 1800s. My grandfather purchased it at the turn of the century and had it right towards the Depression. And then unfortunately, like the Grapes of Wrath, he had to pack his 11 kids, put them into cars, and drive to California. Uh, but it's always special. We've had three family reunions at the Auburn uh, Neely Mansion, and uh, my mom did an oral history with me, and she pointed you know, to the room, and we were actually in the room she was born in. And um, uh, Mark, who's, just, who's in our audience, he's, uh, his family's from Auburn as well, gave me some beautiful pictures of the Auburn uh, baseball team. So it's very precious to, to see uh, friends of our family. Harry Fukuhara was a famous MIS soldier during World War II, and I saw him at a dinner, and he asked where I was from, and uh, I told him that my mom was from Auburn, Washington. He goes, well, I grew up in Auburn. He goes, the Fukudas are, are your mom's family? I said, yeah. He goes, man, he goes, our bus would pull up, Fukudas would be on the bus, and you'd look into the house, and more Fukudas were coming out of the house. And I said, well, <laughs> There was 11 of them, so uh, it's, it's certainly, you know, uh, Tony, to come back, uh, it's, it's almost like coming back home for me because we had such great reunions, and uh, I want to thank Jerry Cohen uh, for uh, hosting uh, our uh, podcast tonight. I mean, tonight uh, is very special because we've turned Ebbets Field flannels into a museum. Uh, most museums you go into have gift stores. Well. His gift store tonight is going to be a museum, and uh, from the Wing Luke Museum, you see these panels. Uh, all these textiles were developed recently. That's going to be part of a, a special kind of a grand opening. So uh, Jerry and I go back to 1996, and uh, one of the images I always like to share as a kid growing up, uh, it's kind of a small image, but this is Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. And in 1927, on October 29th, uh, Lou Gehrig chose my uncle and his Nisei teammates to be on his team at Fireman's Ballpark in Fresno, and they got beat 13 to 3. Uh, Babe got thundered that day. But for me, it was a, a great kind of uh, anointment because I wanted my son and his teammates never to forget their elders or the Nisei pioneers. And so when I put this exhibit together, uh, Jerry provided the Bustin Babe uniform. And then I took a replica of my uncle's uniform and distressed both of them so they look like they're from that era. And it really made our exhibit epic, uh, as the way I put it. And it uh, went from a small uh, museum at the Fresno Art Museum to uh, Cooperstown at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and then even made it to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Tokyo. So uh, I really appreciate Evans Field Flannels, Jerry Cohen, his whole team. In fact, while we're here, there's a, a Nakagawa proverb that's in my book. To keep the flow of goodness coming, you always got to be thankful. And so I just want to thank Jerry, uh, of course, Tony Black and King 5 News, uh, Lisa Cooper, Jerry's uh, teammates, uh, uh, Hallie McGee, 
uh, Danny, Steve, Thomas with Offbeat uh, Films, uh, David, Tiame, um, North American Post, David Yamaguchi's here tonight, uh, Misa Murahashi, uh, Tomi Amori Gucci, uh, the Oye family for spreading the word, our uh, Nisei Baseball Research Project team, uh, Barry Rosenbush, Jeff Friedman, Bill Staples, and artist uh, Chris Felix, who did this uh, 75th anniversary of the 9066. Uh, he wanted to incorporate Nisei Baseball, the 442, and uh, Baseball in the Camps. So uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Tony, for yeah. moderating. Of course. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So we're going to talk a little bit about some influential people, both local and global, and then we'll watch a quick video, and then we'll open it up to some questions for that afterwards. So let's get right into it. We'll talk first about Frank Fukuda. Uh, he is labeled the father of Japanese-American baseball here in Seattle. So my first question is, why does he deserve to have that title? Um, Danny, can we show that one image? Yeah. Well, if, if you look at the very front, uh, Jerry uh, and Lisa have uh, a nice poster of Frank Fukuda. For me, Frank Fukuda, uh, when we talk about, you know, the theme of tonight is um, the bridge across the Pacific, Japanese-American pioneers in the early 1900s. And uh, long, long before Shohei Otani, Ichiro, um, and we can go down the list. I mean, there's practically an Asian ball player on every major league team today. And I always like to come back to the pioneers in the 1900s. And Frank Fukuda here on the right, he uh, was such an amazing ball player himself. And imagine in 1906, he was a player. Then he starts uh, the uh, Seattle Cherry team, the Seattle Asahi team. Um, they, uh, I want to just get some of his statistics here. Um, in 1914, he took the Asahi to Japan. And then he goes back in 1918, and they had a 25, they had 25 uh, games, and they won uh, 16 of them. Uh, and they, he went back again in 1921 with the Asahi. But he ended up eventually in Portland and he was part of the Portland Mikados team. But Frank, uh, uh, I have a quote from one of his teammates that uh, basically encapsulates kind of the, the essence of Frank Fukuda. But when they went in 1914, and that's an early tour to Japan to play teams, uh, merchant teams, the college teams in Japan, uh, one of the main reasons uh, as a quote that Mr. Nakamura said for their tour is to observe Japanese society and the economy, but most importantly to learn about their Yamato Damashi, their samurai roots. And th in that way to become a Japanese American Japanese rather than an Americanized Japanese. And if we do something in the American style but with a Japanese way of thinking, we can produce a superior combination of both those two cultures. Uh, I always thought of that quote by Frank because I thought it was such a progressive co quote from not just a community leader, uh, a coach, former player, but to be able to have that essence to really uh, appreciate your culture, your heritage, your customs, uh, which I've always crusaded with my family and my parents crusaded to me to be a Japanese-American Japanese. Uh, and what I think what Frank meant by that is that, you know, we love our culture, we love our heritage, we love our customs. If you're just going to be an Americanized Japanese, then maybe you're not so into those different aspects and those dynamics of, of being proud of your culture, your customs, your heritage. Uh, I certainly am. Uh, I'm a third generation Sansei. Uh, my kids are Yonsei and our grand, two grandkids are Gosei, fifth. So I, I love that quote about Frank Fukuda. And when you think about the tours that Japanese American teams went in the early 1900s, uh, the, C the Seattle Asahi, the Mikados, the Cherry team um, were the pioneers, absolute pioneers of that. Uh, right after that, in Fresno, the Fresno Athletic Club, which my Uncle Johnny was part of, and Kenichi Zenimura, they went to Japan in 1924 and 1927. 
the, there was five teams from America that went to Japan on these exhibition tours. The San Jose Asahi went in 1924. The Stockton Yamatos went in 1928. The Alamino Kono All-Stars went in 1937. The LA Nippons went in 1931. So to me, that's why Tony, you know, Frank Fukuda is, is such a, an amazing pioneer to have when you think about it, it took 15 days just to get to Japan on a ship. So they're traveling just to travel before the exhibitions even start, a month. And then once they got there, they play, would play merchant teams, the college teams. But I really consider them the uh, ones that opened up this bridge across the Pacific that today flows both ways. I mean, we have so many major leaguers now that extend their careers in Japan. And by the same token, look how many players from Asia are coming over here, raising the bar up at a major league level. Absolutely. Okay, and you had mentioned uh, Kenichi Zinomura, um, this gentleman actually here that we have here on this p picture mm -hmm. behind. He's being considered for enshrinement in the uh, Japan Baseball Hall of Fame in Tokyo. So what is his importance to you? And then also talk about the bridge that you had just mentioned. You talked about the bridge mm -hmm. that uh, he built with uh, his baseball diplomacy. Well, Kenichi, again, much like uh, Frank Fukuda. In fact, the 1927 tour, uh, Frank and Kenichi got together for a 4th of July um, championship showdown to see who would go to Japan. And so, uh, unfortunately, like Tiame, who, who lived in Fresno, he knows the Fresno heat. Uh, they came July 4th, which was probably tip, tri uh, tipple, you know, triple digits. And they made sure that the visitor's dugout faced the sun. And so uh, the Fresno Athletic Club thundered the uh, Seattle Asahi. Uh, they wilted under that extreme heat. So the Fresno Athletic Club got to go to Japan in 27. In fact, they were undefeated other than beating the Philadelphia Royal Giants, the all-stars of the Negro Leagues. Uh, but uh, Frank was so upset in 28 they had a 4th of July game here in Seattle, and uh, it was pouring rain, and he refused to let both teams get off the field even during this downpour, because I'm sure he remembered what Kenichi did to him with that hot dugout. So it was like one aspect is welcome to Fresno and the heat. The following year, they're playing in the rain in Seattle. Uh, but they were the best of uh, rivals and friends, and both enhanced our history uh, to an, an amazing. Kenichi himself, uh, the reason why we feel that he should be part of this bridge, and uh, if Kenichi gets in, then Frank Fukuda should be following up very closely after. Uh, I think it, they, they worked hand in hand. But Kenichi went on tours to Japan as early as 1924, 1927. Uh, in 27, uh, like this image with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth wanted to go to Japan. And so Kenichi arranged that he could probably get him there on a $40,000 stipend, but the Babe wanted sixty, dollars uh, So he couldn't get that. But a few years later, he finally got the sixty, and he went in thirty-one, and was absolutely um, loved and was a hero in Japan. They called him Babe Russo. Uh, but Kenichi, not only from his aspect of taking tours to Japan as early as 24 and 27, he uh, you know, really was known for his uh, ability to build baseball fields. Uh, in 1924, uh, he built the fr uh, Japanese ballpark in Fresno. Uh, during World War II, he built the Fresno Assembly Center ballpark. Uh, and during World War II, at the Gila River, uh, uh, concentration camp in uh, Gila River, Arizona, he built a field of dreams with a grass infield, grass outfield, uh, castor bean, home run fence. He chalked the lines uh, with flour. Um, everywhere he met, went, he basically built a, a baseball diamond. But I think it was his, uh, his diplomacy, his ambassadorship, um, and we're hopeful that the Japan Hall of Fame recognizes him and and he would, I think, would be our first choice uh, if the National Baseball Hall of Fame were to recognize one of our uh, players. It certainly would be Kenichi as well. So with 
Kenichi, and this is kind of going off, but with Kenichi's impact and also with Frank's, is it fair to ask why they are not already in the Baseball Hall of Fame there in Tokyo? Well, Tony, that's what our NBRP, our Nisei Baseball Research Project, for the last 21 years have been crusading for. You know, our mission is to bring awareness and education about Japanese Americans, primarily in the concentration camps during World War II, but also through our multimedia projects uh, and just the fact that at the Baseball Hall of Fame, they have the Pride and the Passion, which is an exhibit on all the All-Stars in the that, that were played in the Negro Leagues, the All-Star Blacks that uh, played in leagues of their own. We have the All-American Girls story. Uh, we have the Latino in baseball, which is all the Latinos that have played. So certainly we're, you know, kind of been sitting at the back of the history bus wondering when do we get, you know, our visibility and get our players in. And recently, because of the internet, we've uh, been able to find 12 box scores where Black All-Stars faced uh, Nisei All-Stars. And out of the 12 box scores that we have pre-war, the Nisei won eight out of the 12 games. Uh, there's 17 Negro Leaguers in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, other than Buck O'Neill, who was like an uncle to me, and started the uh, Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City. It's also the Jazz uh, Hall of Fame Museum. Uh, so we're hopeful, Tony, yeah. that uh, our story and some of our players. I mean, we're not asking for 17 uh, Issei or Nisei ball players, but certainly we'd like to get in a few, and uh, Kenichi would be one, and, and Frank, and Wally Yonamina, and I could go down the list <laughs> of, of great players that, uh, if they were had given a chance to play in Major League Baseball, which they weren't, um, that's why, to me, the Blacks and the, uh, the Nisei ball players were such an important force in Japan pre-war. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So speaking of that, the, did the Japanese and the black baseball all-stars who were the ambassadors in the early 1900s, did they help start uh, pro baseball in Japan in the 1930s? Well, pro baseball started in 1936 in Japan. And many uh, Babe Ruth went with the uh, major league all-stars in the 30s. Um, there have been college teams that have gone to Japan and done well. But to me, you really have to look at the Issei, Nisei ball players and the black all-stars that went as early as 27, way before the Major League Baseball all-stars went. And they helped influence, the, you know, an American style. They uh, uh, showed them that, you know, it's, it's a game that could be played both ways. You can play short, you know, a short game. You could play small ball. Uh, not necessarily you're going to hit a home run every time, but mainly to show the American style. And I think it really helped progress the game forward. And so my hopes is, is that much like um, with the other exhibits that are at the museum, we'll get recognition where these players will finally be recognized for their achievement to helping pro baseball start in Japan rather than major league baseball players that came way after mm -hmm. them. Well, that's my thoughts. <laughs> <and hopes. laughs> Definitely. Okay, so let's uh, kind of talk more about some of the, the local connections here, like in the local stories and the impact that they had on you personally. Well, in 2001, Tony, I started, uh, uh, and, and kind of going through the journey, if I could, uh, basically, uh, you know, baseball's been in my family for four generations. My grandpa went from Hiroshima, Japan, which I saw one of the jerseys right here, to the big island of Hawaii, and there was a little village called Ola'a, and my grandpa uh, basically worked seven days a week on a sugarcane plantation. And on Sundays, they'd give him a couple hours to play baseball and play the other plantations. So my grandfather in 1886 came to the mainland, or California. His dream was to have a, a farm. And my uncle Johnny was born in uh, 1900 in Ola'a, uh, my dad was born in 1905. So my Uncle Johnny became like the Nisei Babe Ruth. He uh, very close to Shohei Otani. I don't know if some of you are, are familiar with the Angels pitcher and home run hitter. Uh, my Uncle Johnny hit 377 against the, uh, the Black All-Stars. He, uh, uh, at Meiji Stadium, hit two home runs in 1927, one out of the stadium. 
and the manager of the Meiji team offered him a, a scholarship. Uh, of course, he couldn't take it because my grandfather had a 40-acre grape branch and only my dad and his other son, Johnny, to, to work on it. Um, my uh, dad threw a nine-inning no-hitter in high school. Uh, most high schools today only, I think, play seven. Um, I was an all-star shortstop. My son was an all-star catcher, and who knows what our grandbabies are going to do. But you know, baseball has been a, a very proud part of our family for four or five generations. Uh, you know, some families come from military backgrounds or professionals. It just so happened our family had this baseball dynamic, and um, so proud of it. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the to the video, is there is there, is there any other things that you want to kind of share about maybe about what your nonprofit is doing or anything that you want to kind of touch on? Well, our, our Nisei Baseball Research Project, um, you know, we, <laughs> I never thought 21 years later, much like Jerry, probably in the 80s with Ebbets Field Flannels. Uh, and that's what I love about this audience and tonight. I mean, there's so many of us that have had that, uh, that moment where um, we, that light bulb goes on. Uh, for Jerry, it was to have a uniform that he loved, that was his passion, but to make it of high quality. Uh, my light bulb moment, this an anointment, was to make sure my son and his uh, peers would never forget about their elders and the pioneers. Um, so I think we all here have uh, our different passions, that we have our anointment moments. Um, so that's why I'm excited to, to kind of come back to Seattle, to be at Ebbets Fields Flannels Museum, uh, to share, you know, my journey and and also how others like Mark uh, and his his family that played Auburn baseball pre-war. Um, there's a couple uh, uh, people I'd like to show here, Danny, that uh, that I could, if we could advance, that Tony had talked about uh, some local stories that really impacted me. Oh, by the way, this is Kenichi Zenimura and my uncle Johnny here. And this was the Fresno Athletic Club that went to Japan in 1927. And they even recruited a couple of Caucasian, uh, uh, a catcher and a pitcher uh, that were ringers from Fresno State. Uh, that's probably why they went undefeated. Uh, if we can go to the next one. Of course, here's Kenichi Zenimura. I love this uh, uh, pose of him. And uh, this uniform he's wearing, it's uh, Jane's and Company which was a semi-pro uh, baseball team. And he also was the manager of Al's Bar, which was a part of the Twilight League. Uh, but in the 1920s, to have a Japanese-American manager of uh, two all-white teams, I mean, that was unheard of, you know. So that's why I really feel he broke down barriers, he changed perceptions, and, and that's one of the things, Tony, that every project that we do with our Nisei Baseball Research Project that's our through line, our crusade, is to break down barriers and change perceptions. And hopefully with some of the multimedia projects that we've done, um, it will have done that. Uh, this is a, uh, we, he just passed away. He was a uh, Hood River uh, Fuji uh, uh, apple grower. His name is Kei Kiyakawa. And this is Bob Moore and Bob Hill. Bob Hill, excuse me. Uh, Kay, in 1936, was a left-handed pitcher for Oregon State. And then the war comes, and uh, because of the Friends of Society, the Quakers, uh, Kay and 500 Nisei were able to get college scholarships. Uh, the Quakers felt that it was uh, such an injustice to take away Japanese Americans' homes, businesses, college education. So they very generously offered scholarships to uh, UConn, University of Connecticut, uh, Ohio State, and uh, University of Delaware. Kay went to UConn, and you can't tell here, but Kay is about four foot ten, a uh, little taller than a fire hydrant, right? He became the starting running back for UConn and the starting left handed pitcher. And, uh, we were going to the Japan Hall of Fame, and Kay was sitting next to me, and I said, hey, Kay, I said, here you are at Yukon. You're considered an enemy alien, which the government considered Japanese Americans from California, Oregon, and Washington. I said, and you're playing baseball. How did that feel, or you know, what was the reaction? 
And he goes, well, Kerry, he goes, I'll never forget, UConn was playing the University of Maine. And my first at bat, I went from the on-deck circle to home plate, and both uh, stands started chanting, Tojo, 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 the uh, uh, evil general from Japan. And I said, well, how'd that make you feel? He goes, well, it pissed me off. He goes, I had no connection to him. He goes, so I hit a double down the line. <laughs> and he goes, then my second at bat coming out from the on-deck circle, he goes, only the University of Maine students were chanting, Tojo, Tojo, Tojo. I said, well, what did you do then? He goes, well, I hit a triple to right center. <laughs> and he goes, but what was amazing, my third at bat, I was leaving the on-deck circle, and both stands started chanting, slugger, slugger, slugger. And um, I chuckled and laughed, and, but I used that a lot in my presentations because I thought, what a beautiful story and how sport or baseball with three at-bats can change perceptions and break down barriers, much like Jackie did with the Brooklyn Dodgers. You know, but that's our uh, local uh, Hood River Keikiakawa story that I love to share. Um, you go to the next one. This is another one, the Wapato Nippons of Washington State. Uh, they played the Tokyo Giants in 1931. And this was at the Wapato uh, Baseball Diamond, which, you, as you can see, was a beautiful stadium. Uh, here's all the Wapato. The, yes, there was five Seri <laughs> brothers on this team. Uh, on this virtual uh, Tokyo Giants team, there was many, many future Hall of Famers. Uh, Eiji Sawamura, Victor Starfin, uh, Mizuhara. I mean, I could go on and on. Just about everyone on this team was a, a major all-star. And the uh, Wapato Nippons had them like five to three, and then in the last inning, the Tokyo Giants came back and, and won the game. But the story I like to talk about the Wapato Nippons is that in the pre-war era, they, I mean, right here, the Wapato Nippons, they were playing for the championship, the Caucasian Wapato community team. And it was the first time both teams were uh, actually playing each other. And, the Wapato Nippons were actually on a Native American uh, reservation. And so the community team plays the Wapato Nippons. Uh, the Wapato uh, Nippons, uh, the, whenever two teams played each other, they split the gate, okay? So whatever they charge for admission, at the end of the day, they split the gate. Well, during the course of the game, one of the players of the uh, Wapato community team, he slides in the home and he breaks his ankle. And so with only nine guys, that was pretty much a forfeit. They couldn't field another guy. So the uh, Wapato manager uh, told Herbie Seri, told uh, the Wapato community manager that we're not gonna win a championship on a forfeit. Uh, so we'll have to reschedule. And the umpire said, well, they can't feel, you know, the, the team, so you actually can win. He goes, no, we can't win on a forfeit. And by the way, this is our uh, gate receipts, and we want to give it to you to fix your player's ankle that just broke it. It changed the whole dynamics between the bitterness of the Wapato Nippons and the community team. Uh, so I always like to use this as a great example of uh, kind of reminds me of the uh, local writer, uh, Ken Mochizuki, Baseball Saved Us. Uh, it, it just shows the beauty of how uh, this bitter rivalry could dissipate by just one act of uh, generosity. Uh, this was kind of an end thing, <laughs> but this was uh, Christian Yelich. He won the MVP. He's a fifth generation Gosei. He's j half Japanese American. His grandfather was an Oda. Um, and uh, while we're talking about Christian and biracialness, uh, Danny, our part of our, our great uh, web team tonight, his uh, grandma and his grandfather met at the post in concentration camp and fell in love and got married. And so from his grandparents' standpoint, uh, being in camp wasn't a, a negative situation. It, it turned out to be you know, a positive thing for both his grandparents, so that was a nice story to share. Awesome. Uh, 
Um, do you want to get into the, to the video? Now? Oh, uh, well, I consider myself a multimedia person. Yep. So what I wanted to do is show uh, uh, out of the 21 years, you know, we're going to come across a lot of interviews and articles. But uh, I, I came up with this kind of highlight reel I hope you guys enjoy with most of the pioneers you'll see in this uh, uh, video, they're all gone. Uh, and then a friend of ours, Don Wakamatsu, in 2008 and 2009, a family friend of ours, was the manager for the Seattle Mariners. And then he uh, became the bench coach for the Kansas City Royals when they won the World Series and last year with the uh, Texas Rangers. So this is uh, kind of a highlight reel. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy. It may come as some surprise to learn that Japanese immigrants actually brought the game here with them after it had been introduced in Japan by an American teacher back in 1873. And though there were no Japanese Americans in the big leagues, they had their own leagues. And during World War II, the team Bill Sukamoto was on faced World Series pitcher Spud Chandler. He took a three pitcher and he tried to hang a curveball. We had we had the two to hang in the pitcher. But most of the ball playing Japanese Americans did during the war took place in internment camps. This model is of the one in Hilo River, Arizona. Herb Karima played on that field, and though this treatment of American citizens could easily have embittered him, it wasn't something he dwelt on. Instead, he and his buddies played ball, hoping to bring some measure of joy and entertainment to those in the camp. Every ball player had a nickname, of course. Herbs was Moon. The reason? And my own name is to make moonshine. 90 year old Shizuto Kamamura <laughs> says they built their own <laughs> field of dreams. Sort of a home gate scraper and friendly roundup, you know. And first, there'd be a lot of pebbles, rocks, and everything in, in the field. For immigrant communities isolated by color barriers, it gave a sense of unity. In 1923, Takeo Utsumi was a bat boy. Later, he earned a famous nickname. Uh, they couldn't pronounce my name. You know, they, these guys didn't associate with the Japanese. So, uh, uh, they said, well, just call him Babe. And then Babe got a chance to see the Babe, an exhibition game with the slugger and Lou Gehrig. Uh, I remember when Babe Ruth and Gehrig came to Stockton. Uh, they would call him out on anything. They would always say, one more, one more. I'm going to get one over the fence and everybody would Slight stature and discrimination may have prevented some players from any chance of making it to the big leagues. Then the war dashed all hope. And from behind the wire of an internment camp was the only place they could play ball. Diamonds in the rough made their mark on the mound. Rusty Jordan, CNN, San Francisco.
1920 to the 40s, World War II interrupted their dreams, though. They were sent to camps, most never returned to baseball. One player had tears in his eyes today as he talked about finally being remembered. By all my kids are here, my, my brothers and sisters, I think they're my family, they're almost 30 of us here. Is it wonderful, though, to see yeah. the honor they're paying to the Japanese American players? I'm very happy, right? I worked the fields in Tennessee, but dreamed of better days. I left the plow and came back to join the homestead graze. All summer long, we played the states in heavy sound football. Through rain and dust, we rode the bus so we could play baseball. We played for love, we played for pride, and seldom made much more. The bread and beans, the hope their eyes, the seaside came with the life we chose. But we made do and we came through because we were pros. We played in shadows of the bay with Lou Gehrig and the rest. And stood outside the big league fence while they were called the best. But we played as well in game with every hit and pitch. But stay behind the color line and watch those boys get rich. But did they see Josh Gibson swing or Satchel throw his stuff? And do you know how much it takes when best is not enough? When the clouds roll in across the sky and hide the brightest moon, it's then you'll find some stars don't shine. Some folks were born too soon. God bless you, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays and all. You wore numbers on your backs when you played big league ball. And every time you hit one out, or slid, or laid one down, you carried us from that old bus to the hall of Cooperstown. Inside the Tokyo Dome at SBC Park, the game is the same. Tonight, we celebrate 150 years of U.S.-Japan relations and honor the pioneers of this positive dynamic of diplomacy and baseball. Who can forget Willie Mays and his catch in the 54 World Series or Roberto Clemente's cannon arm, Ozzie Smith's dazzling plays up the middle, or giant Kevin Mitchell's barehanded grab? the acrobatics of Ken Griffey Jr., or home run king Sadahara O's 868 power drives. 
Masafumi Yamamori of the Hamakyu Braves made this legendary catch to rob a potential home run. A play that major league ball players voted the best they had ever seen. In 1854, Commodore Perry opened Japan to the world, and in 1872, Horace Wilson introduced baseball, and the cross-cultural tours of the game began. The 1934 Babe Ruth Lou Gehrig All-Stars ignited baseball crazy fans, and two years later, Professional baseball gave birth to the Tokyo Giants. The early 1900s brought Nisei, African Americans, Latinos, and major leaguers together for goodwill tours to Asia. But back at home, the other Americans played in leagues of their own. They played for the love of the game and crusaded to break down barriers and change perceptions. Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, the Kansas City Monarchs and Jackie Robinson would draw up to 40 and 50,000 fans at their stadiums. After the war, baseball ambassadors like the San Francisco Seals, Lefty O'Doul, Joe DiMaggio would raise the spirits of the people with their goodwill visits. A 10-game exhibition series drew a half a million fans. Hawaiian-born and future Japan Hall of Famer Wally Yonamine was a pioneer for future American ball players and changed the game in Japan towards more of an American style. Masanori Murakami became the first player from Japan to play in the majors, and he opened the door for future pitchers to succeed in the big leagues. Sakata, also from Hawaii, would win a World Series ring with the Orioles, and he paved the way for position players from Japan. Who Raul Muzzi, 150 years ago, the a Japanese would become a leading hitter in America's Major League Baseball. Let's play ball! Weren't you supposed to bring Ichiro tonight? Right. I'm down with Komatsu <laughs> Bench Coach of the Oakland A's, and uh, just want to take a moment and say uh, thanks for, for allowing me to, to, to take a moment and speak to you guys and, and really give my thanks for uh, having the opportunity to uh, be sitting here in the first place because of what you guys have accomplished and what, uh, the, the, the tr struggles that you guys have went through. I have a, a quick story that I spent with my uh, grandmother uh, after the season last year in Seattle. My grandmother lives in, uh, grandfather and grandmother live in Hood River, Oregon. And, wanted to find, a little, uh, find out a little bit about what went on in the camps and to be able to continue that legacy with my children. And uh, we were talking uh, in their house that they had lived in the last 50 or 60 years and uh, she had told me for the first time, after I spent a lot of time as a kid there, uh, that these, the houses that they're actually living in there were part of the, uh, the buildings that, that uh, they spent time in the camp. After the camp, uh, they let them out and were able to purchase those buildings and to be able to sit in that building some. 70 or so years later, uh, really brought almost a tear to my eyes to know what you guys have went through and, and uh, to allow people like myself the opportunity to, to continue to be sitting in the seat that I am right now. So I just want to take this moment and say, from the bottom of my heart, thanks for, for everything you guys have done for uh, the future generations. Thank you. The good old American game of baseball. It did help to transcend the sins of bigotry and hatred. More importantly, it brought a sense of great pride and respect to our respective countries and our peoples. But I've always said, whether Issei, Nisei, Sansei, or Yonsei, if we do not preserve this unique chapter in American baseball history, it's all going to be about Nosei. I'm Pat Morita, and I thank you sincerely, all of you, for sharing with us. And the rocket red flare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled
We uh, lost Pat six Thanksgivings ago, but every time I see him singing it, because I've been with him when he sang the national anthem with the Diamondbacks, the Dodgers, the Giants, uh, Sacramento Kings. Uh, we showed this documentary at my old high school, and I remember uh, the, it was right after 9-11, and the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classes stood up, and they had their hearts on their uh, chest, you know, and I told Pat, he was living in Las Vegas, uh, I said, Pat, I said, the whole school, when you sang the national anthem, put their hands to their heart. That was the greatest uh, act of patriotism I saw after 9-11. I said, and, and how proud am I? It came from my Red Cats, you know, my high school. And I said, and the first question was, uh, you know, Mr. Morita or Mr. Miyagi likes to sing the national anthem. Why does he do that when they imprison his whole family during World War II? And I, I Tony, can pretty much answer just about any Q&A question, and I couldn't on that one. Yeah. So I called him that night, and I told him, I said, what do I tell that kid? He goes, you tell that kid, you old man, that I've been around the world a couple of times as Mr. Miyagi, and despite the bumps and bruises our families and communities took during World War II, despite you know all of the uh, sacrifice that our family went through, he goes, it's still the greatest country in the world. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. And so you tell that kid, that's why I sing the national anthem. I'm not a great singer, but I could sing the national anthem great. <laughs> no lack of confidence. Right. Right? And he even had a little blues riff to it. But uh, so yeah, that's the thing about filmmakers. I mean, whenever we create something, it's, uh, you become immortalized. So when I see Pat singing that, it's like he's right here with us tonight. And, uh, but again, thank you all for, for sharing and joining in. Is there any other questions, or shall we get yeah, to Yeah, we can open it up to some Q&A to you guys out there if you have any questions for them that you'd like to ask. Any other stories that you'd like to share, too? You've done a lot of research in, about uh, Japanese American baseball in California. Have you thought about doing a little in Washington and Oregon? Well, you know, the my title of my book, uh, Japanese Americans in Baseball, or, or especially the, uh, the paperback. It's Japanese Americans in Baseball in California. It really should be and the entire world uh, because, you know, we've had teams that went as far south as the Tijuana Nippons, as far north as the Vancouver Asahi, as far west as the Hawaiian Asahi, as far east as the Nebraska Nisei. So it really... Uh, is much more than just California, you know. Um, I certainly would like to expand on it. You know, the reason why I wrote the first book, uh, uh, 100 Years of Japanese American in Baseball, is to kind of be the template so others would pick up on different areas that could expand on it. Um, and that's how it keeps growing. I mean, just like tonight, Mark brought me these photos of the Auburn uh, uh, pre-war baseball team. You know, I have to dive into that even more because maybe some of my mom's brothers are in this, this photo too. So that's how it kind of synergizes, you know, but um, I certainly would love to develop more. In fact, there, one of the questions I got was uh, the University of Washington made numerous tours to Japan as well. Um, that I don't have a lot of knowledge on. You know, I know they made about four or five tours, but if somebody could get into the, that aspect deeper, um, and maybe you might want to <laughs> try it. Uh, but no, I, I always look at it as, you know, as it's an ongoing morphine thing that keeps growing. And uh, I would have never thought 21 years ago I'd still be involved with it. Questions? I, I actually had a question. Sure. Um, what, what is the possibility of guys like Nietzsche and Frank Vakuda joining the Baseball Hall of Fame in the States, is, it, is that just something that's just for professional players? Or is there, because um, I know there's a Negro League Museum, uh, Hall of Fame and sure. Museum. Are any of those players also in the American Baseball Hall of Fame or any Japanese players in the Baseball Hall of Fame? That's my question. Well, our exhibit was there in 1996, and it was just a six-month 
temporary exhibit, traveling exhibit. Uh, our goal is to get not only some of our ball players, but right now we have a wooden home plate from Zenimura Field that was at Gila River, Arizona. That's at the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's in an exhibit called the Era of Change. So in that exhibit, you'll see uh, Bobby Thompson's cleats. He hit the famed home run heard around the world. Uh, just different aspects. Our wooden home plate is such an iconic part of the uh, museum because it actually travels with Baseball as America. Right. Cooperstown had their own traveling exhibit. Uh, I'm sure it came to Seattle. It must have come here because they toured to about every major league city. And so, Tuami, I'm hoping that, yeah, we will get uh, our story, our exhibit, uh, more than just one artifact and then eventually more players and, um, but again, I think it would ripple. If we could get in like Kenichi, then certainly Frank Fukuda would certainly be in line right. and, and many others. And so that's why tonight's an important dynamic because we're able to bring out the legacy of Frank Fukuda, uh, bring out the legacy of Kenichi, of Keikiakawa, the Wapato Nippons, um, so to inspire others to maybe want to do stories or docs or books mm -hmm. uh, on them. Awesome. That's what we're hopeful for. I mean, it's a, a salad bowl of cultures already at the museum. Uh, I just think, uh, and, and one of the things I always try and, my three main uh, issues is that we had major league baseball players like Otani and Ichiro and Tanaka and many of the great players. Uh, that have played at a major league level in the 20s and 30s. But they never got an opportunity. They had the tools, they had the passion, they just never got an opportunity to play because there was a color line at Major League Baseball. If you were black, if you were Asian, Latinos, you could probably get in if you're, a lot of times it came down to skin color. You know, if you weren't a dark Latino, uh, you probably can't get in, but if you're a light, colored Latino, you might get in Major League Baseball. So our uh, crusade is to recognize many of the players, uh, much like in the Negro Leagues, that didn't get to play Major League Baseball, but they had the tools, they had the passion, uh, they just didn't get an opportunity. The second one is that recognize our black all-stars and our Asian all-stars that went to Japan and Korea, Manchukuo, China, as our American ambassadors. They Look at all the uh, Asian players that come and play at Major League Baseball now. These players are the great godfathers, to me, of the players that are playing today. Uh, hopefully they understand, and some of them maybe are historians, so they get it. And then the third is to, uh, because it was such a dark subject in our American history when Japanese Americans were put into the concentration camps, but they kept baseball or the All-American pastime alive, even from behind Bob Wire. Um, and I've had issues with major league teams to recognize some of our pioneers in this way because they said, well, it's such a dark stain on our history. And for me, that's marginalizing our great ball players and pioneers so they still can't get a voice. So that, those are the primary three crusades that we're after is to recognize our pre-war ball players that were great major league ball players at the time but they just couldn't play it. Uh, recognize them as American ambassadors and three, you know, recognize that they kept the all-American pastime alive uh, even from behind Bob Wire. And I think this xenophobia that existed at the time for Japanese Americans, uh, these stories, our books, and these films uh, are more relevant today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago when the books came out. Um, so that's kind of like one of the things too, if, unless there's any other questions. My shameless plug <laughs> is for uh, Bill Staples. Uh, uh, Ebbets Field Flannels is selling Bill Staples' book. Uh, it's an in-depth, in-depth uh, study on Kenichi Zenimura and all his accomplishments. Uh, our film, uh, Diamonds in the Rough, it's a 34-minute documentary on um, basically Pat being our narrator and walking us through kind of the history. Uh, American pastime, uh, it's, it's such a, uh, uh, 
I got to see this movie go from an idea to five years later, 65 cast and crew members working so hard on the Utah desert to make this film. But it's about baseball, jazz music, and a love story told in a Japanese American concentration camp in Utah. And then, of course, there's my book, uh, Japanese Americans Baseball in California. Uh, and then there's also De uh, Dennis Snelling's book on Left Field Duel, um, uh, Marissa Moss's ba Bob Wire Baseball, and Ken Mochizuki's Baseball Save Us. So we have uh, quite a, a lot of great uh, Christmas gifts for you guys, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you're inclined. But uh, more importantly, uh, we just thank you so much for uh, being part of this podcast, uh, being part of this historical museum at Ebbets Fields tonight and um, you know certainly looking forward to sharing more stories and you know the thing that's really uh, tough is that most of our pioneers that greatest generation they're all gone you know uh, I told Jerry tonight that he has a Guadalupe YMBA jersey that they're going to release and I know two of the original Guadalupe YMBA players but one just got out of the hospital a couple days ago and the other one just lost his hearing recently and so uh, but they're 92 you know they've had a great run around the track and uh, but I know they'll be very proud when I tell them that Ebbets Field is recreating their jersey and therefore their players and their history. No other questions? Do we have any other questions? <laughs> David? <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jerry? I have a very selfish uh, professional question. Sure. Uh, how many of the original uniforms are actually in existence? And wow. The cast or the Japanese American team that's before us? Well, right now, Jerry, we have, uh, I'll send you a photo of it. Uh, some of them with our exhibit, we return to the, the lenders. Uh, some were gifted. Uh, that we still show uh, with our exhibit. But I'd say the actual pre-war jerseys, maybe five or six, and post-war, about the same amount. So maybe 12 to 15. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, you know, that. Sure, sure. Oh well, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely share them with you. Oh, is there? Yeah. Okay. At the uh, Wing Luke Museum? No, no, it's Nisei Vet. Oh, Nisei Vet? Okay. Yeah. Just on the other side of the Because a lot of the ball players were also ball players, too, you know, veterans. Yeah. So uh, we have an Aloha a photo with, uh, he uh, was really one of the kind of, uh, Frank Takata was a, a great ball player. They were headed to the 100th, was headed to uh, Italy during World War II, and Milton Eisenhower found out how great this Aloha baseball team was, so they stopped him and made him divert to go to Italy to North Africa, and Joe Takata uh, was never, they threw him curveballs, never threw him a fastball, because he was known for his power, and it was a 0-0 game in the ninth inning, and Takata came up and hit a walk-off home run for the Aloha team to win. And yet, unfortunately, like Ted Williams, you know, his last at bat as a major leaguer before he went to war was a home run. But unfortunately, in Joe's case, they went to Italy and he was the first of the 100th to be killed in action. Um, but it, it's a great story about the Aloha team and Joe Takata and his, uh, his last at bat. Sweet. Terry, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank I appreciate you, it. Thank you for appreciate taking it. the time to share the stories with us. And thank if you. there are no other questions, thank you guys for coming. Thank appreciate you guys. it. Have a great night, you guys. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>